and was really badly hurt. And one of the men told my father, you went too far this time, she's gonna die. And my dad was just like, she's mine, I can do what I want. This episode is sponsored by BetterHelp Online Therapy. Visit betterhelp.com slash Padilla because sometimes existing is exhausting. And if you wanna watch this episode with no ads, completely uncensored because this topic is innately going to have a lot of censorship, click the join button down below to become a member. Anyway. Hello, Mary. Hi. We originally reached out to you because we wanted you to be part of our human trafficking survivors episode, but your story is just way too complex. I feel like it needed its entire own interview for us to get deep into all the elements of your story. Thank you. Can you get into the things that you witnessed as a child? First, I want to say that my life is really good now. My recovery, though, was from um, child trafficking. My parents were my pimps. They prostituted me. They took child of me. And they also, some of the abuse would be considered by some people, satanic ritual abuse. The things that were done to me are done to other children and included um, being placed in a coffin with a corpse. It wasn't just any corpse. It was my sister. My sister died when I was nine and she was 11. And she was the person in the family I could trust. I couldn't, we couldn't trust our parents. Mm -hmm. And so I had some memory of, of of thinking she was the lucky one mm -hmm. because she died. She had brain cancer. Uh, she died in a hospital. She was not murdered, but then her body was taken to our church and I was there. It was in the middle of the night or wee hours of the morning and they made me watch while they um, mutilated my sister's body. They put a knife in my hand. And I've wondered, like, how did they get me to do that? And I, it, I really felt guilty that I had uh, cut my sister's body. But really, my dad just said, do it, and I did it. I mean, we were, that's just how it was. Well, he gave you plenty of reasons to fear him. Oh, yeah, so many reasons to fear him. Before I went to... Um, kindergarten, we had um, a cat that had kittens. And so, you know, we loved the little kittens. And they made us stand at the side of the house while they, in a ritualistic way, killed our kittens. They threw the kitten at the house and they had water there to drown kittens. I mean, these were several different kittens, but we had to stand for a long time watching our kittens die. And then they said, the same thing will happen to you if you tell about the abuse. And you blocked these memories out for a very... Until I was 37. So when I was first remembering my abuse, I kept having this image of my body as an adult being thrown at a wall. And I couldn't understand what that was about. But eventually I realized it was the kittens being thrown at a wall. I experienced another ritualistic event was witnessing a black man being murdered on a cross. Yeah, I was about eight years old, being in a, uh, my dad's station wagon, my mom and dad in front, and doc I call him Dr. D in the back seat with me. And then we went to this shack out in the country, and um, the man led us into his house. There were two women, and there was another little girl who was just my size. The man knew knew us, knew my father. He let us in, and then when he did, a gun was pointed at his head. And then the man was put uh, tied to the cross, and a gun was held at my head, a gun was held at the little girl's head. And then um, eight millimeter camera, it was my mom took footage of it. And um, apparently, the kind of people who like to see films of black men being murdered also like to see little girls without clothes on because I was made to do something to that man while he was on the cross. Oh my God. He was told that if he would go along with it and pretend to die willingly like Jesus Christ did, that the little girl wouldn't be killed. 
And so he did. But then as soon as he died, as soon as his last breath, then the gun went off and the little girl was killed. And the gun was at your head as well. There was a gun at my head, but it was taken away at that point. And I, I was told, you know, to, to leave. My mom grabbed my hand. I was supposed to leave because they set the shack on fire. And so I remember that I did not want to leave with the bad people. I wanted to stay with the good people and die. I knew I would die. The women were tied up in the kitchen area of it. And one of the women called out to me and said, little girl, you go, you go and you tell what happened. And I used to think the, the woman was saying, tell what happened to me, tell what happened to us. But no, she was saying, tell what happened because she wanted me to have a reason to want to grow up. I've grown up and I've told and I appreciate this opportunity to tell. Uh, ritual abuse, that was ritualistic with the white cross, black man. And my uh, therapist, when I told her about it, she said, well, that's a lot of imagery, so maybe it's symbolic. So that night, I, uh, I have cousins with similar memories. So I called one of my cousins and I told him what happened. And I said, did that happen to you? And he said, the black men I saw crucified were homeless. They weren't men with families. So he has seen black men crucified on crosses and other of my cousins have too. And I've tried to call like the police and report this because murder, there's no statute of limitations, mm -hmm. but you have to know where it happened. Mm -hmm. And I just knew I lived in the Seattle area. I was put in a car. It seemed like I was driven a very long ways. I fell asleep in the car. I could have been driven to Canada or I could have been you know, still in Seattle area. And the, the ritualistic abuse, you know, they were doing rituals to others and the abuse was forcing you to be there and witness it. Is that right? Or were you well, incorporated into it beyond that? I was five. It was before we left our old house. And well, another way they had killed kittens was hanging them. So I knew you would die with a rope around your neck. They put a rope around my neck and there were several men. And that's the time I saw my mom take money from the men. So it was sex trafficking uh. as well as, but it, it's ritualistic in that there were several men and they would pass me from one man to the next and I wouldn't know if he would drop me and then I would die. And he passed, you know, I was passed to several different men and I was really badly hurt. And one of the men told my father, you went too far this time. She's going to die. I heard him say that. And my dad was just like, she's mine. I can do what I want. And I really wondered if I was going to die. But um, my mother didn't care. She, that was perhaps the hardest part of that day, because I just looked at my mom and wanted her to care. I was really, really badly physically hurt, and she just didn't care. And that's when I tell about my abuse, I really want survivors to know that the emotional abuse was as bad as any of it. So I don't want survivors to compare what happened to me what happened to them, because maybe theirs was emotional, maybe it was psychological, maybe it was um, a one-time instant, and that still can affect you deeply. Do you blame the people in your life for not seeing the signs that you were being abused when you were being abused? I didn't show any signs of abuse. I was the best dressed kid in class. Mm -hmm. I mean, my mom would make my clothes. I mean, I looked like I was very well nourished. And so we looked, like the perfect family. We went to church all the time. The only way you're going to detect the kind of abuse I experienced with such intelligent and evil parents as I had is through investigations. Do you think that people are born evil or do you think they become evil? I know for a fact they were abused and so they did the same thing that was done to them. One way I know that my mother was abused uh, by her father is I saw my mother have sex with my maternal grandfather. It happened enough that he would go into my mother's bedroom with him 
and they would give me chocolate chip cookie dough and so that would be to distract me so I would eat the chocolate chip cookie dough but one time they had me come in my uh, my grandfather had me come in and and abused me and my mother's reaction instead of being protective she beat me after that was over because she said I'm his only special little girl that's just that's Trauma on trauma it's so on trauma. so far beyond what a, yeah, a mother would do. <laughs> and people wonder why someone might repress these Yes, memories, yes, right? it was to stay alive, yeah. yeah. In your documentary, it was even mentioned that a lot of times when children do experience abuse, especially sexual abuse from a guardian figure, the only way for them to cope and survive when they're relying on that person to survive many times is to block out their memory. Yeah. And, that, and that happens all the time. With, it does. With, when did the abuse eventually stop? It didn't end when I was a teenager. It continued to where I was a young adult. Did you have trouble remembering those memories that it had continued into adulthood? I had trouble sharing the fact that that happened. They could get me in a hypnotic state. And um, they did that when I was a child, and they drugged me sometimes too, but they could get me in this state, so they could keep getting me in this state later and into my um, young adulthood. But why it quit happening was because I started becoming my own person. Mm -hmm. I mean, the way I was raised, I had no sense of personhood, and I started seeing that I could make decisions. I was making important decisions as a social worker, and... Um, yeah, I started trusting myself. Do you remember the moment when you first realized that you had these memories, that this part of your life that kind of seemed like a void in terms of your memories, they, they actually had all these colorful images attached to them? I was not the first one in my, in my extended family to remember. So I had an aunt and three cousins with similar memories. Mm. And um, she talked to my parents uh, my parents had come to visit me, and I lived in the same city as my aunt. So I said, well, how did your visit go? And they said, oh, well, we think she's crazy. We're never going to see her again. They said she thinks she was sexually abused by her grandmother, by our, you know, my father said by our grandmother. So when my parents left, I contacted my aunt and said, would you be willing to meet with me? So we met. She told me I had witnessed abuse. And when she said that, I knew it was true. There was a part of me that just went, yeah, that's that happened. And so then I went to, uh, I, I was in counseling with my ex-husband. We were in marriage counseling at the time. And so I stayed with that same counselor. And she said, well, just journal, just write down anything you remember from your childhood, no matter how benign, just anything. And so I started doing that. I was just in my living room alone, sitting on the couch, and I was looking at the wall across from me, and I saw a man's hand holding a dog gruffly. And that was my first image. So I went to my counselor and I asked for hypnosis. She just had me go up the man's hand, and I could see it was my dad. What was it like, that moment, realizing that there was a part of your childhood that you would oh. suppress. What was it like knowing that there was this whole new world to uncover, this horrifying world to uncover? You know what? One of the things that struck me the most is just, you know, I loved my dad. I didn't want it to be true because of me, but I didn't want it to be true because of him. And I remember thinking, you know, I would give every physical possession I have to be able to continue to have a relationship with my father. But I had young children, and that was just, I had to protect him. So I called him and told him about the, uh, having seen the man's hand. That's the only memory I had. And he said, is this gonna lead you to think I sexually abused you? And I'm like, what? No, no, I, I don't think so. So he's the one who brought that up. He volunteered that information. And then he said, I guess this means I'll never see you again. And I'm like, I didn't see that either. After that first memory, 
that was, you know, the sole memory. But then the next time I went to hypnosis, the memory of my sister's um, mutilation of my sister's body came. And for some reason, and this is, shows how thrifty of a person I am, but the session wasn't over yet. And I'm like, well, we can keep going. And so another memory came, which was really upsetting. I started getting these memories just relentless. I mean, as, as I was falling asleep at night, I'd remember more as I was waking up in the morning. Mm. Just during the day, I'd have memories. When you first recovered these memories, many people did not believe you, and maybe they still don't believe you. They say that it's it's too far-fetched and ridiculous. That sounds like something you only see in movies or read about in books. It doesn't actually happen to people. And then they say that there's no way that you can repress a memory like that and then suddenly recover it. Mm -hmm. So you made a documentary, and one of your goals with that documentary was to sit down and have an honest conversation with the people who doubted you. There's even a foundation. What is it? The False yes. Memory Foundation? Yes. False Memory Syndrome Foundation. Yeah. And their their whole idea is to paint this picture that people who recover memories of being abused in their later life are making it up. Yeah. I got to talk to the founder of the False Memory Syndrome Foundation on camera. There was a part of me, an unhealed part, that thought it was kind of like going back to seeing my mom, who was at that point deceased. and. I just kind of thought maybe I could talk her into believing my memories are true, and then she would believe her own daughter. The, the people in this organization, many of the people in this organization, are accused parents. And I think she thought she could get me to not believe my memory. Right. And, you know, of course, neither happened. She really did try to make you believe that your memories were false. She did. She did. And that was a lot. I, and I saw people in the comments sharing the same feeling I had, where they're like, it must be the most difficult thing. Almost how could you sit there with someone telling you that your memories are false? These th th these memories that you have that completely shaped who you are, implying that you're a liar. They were hard interviews. I am so glad that I have that behind me. I'm not I'm not going to put that myself in that position again, but the footage to me is just amazing. Some people might say I'd rather not remember a horrifying situation. My body did a great job of keeping that traumatic event from being part of my everyday recollection. Do you feel better having my unlocked is, all these memories? My life is so much better. I remember it was maybe a year after oh, my memories came, but looking in the mirror and I could see the light in my eyes. I used to just stay worried all the time. I'd have some worry this, worry that, worry about my social work cases, whatever, but I would be constantly worried mm. because I had to block out so I didn't remember. Mm. And now, I mean, I can enjoy the food I eat. I can, I, I just, I have such a nice life. And for just a quick moment, I'd like to thank our sponsors who helped make this series possible. So huge thank you to BetterHelp for sponsoring this episode. Therapy has helped reframe my view of the world and myself by allowing me to feel empathy for my younger self and therefore understand who I am today better. But therapy can be customized to whatever is right for you and can be useful in helping with motivation or feelings of depression, anxiety, stress, insecurity, or whatever else you might need. BetterHelp screens all their therapists to ensure that they have experience and that they're certified and licensed and provides customized therapy that offers video, phone, and even live chat sessions with your therapist so you don't have to see anyone or speak over the phone if that's not something that you're comfortable with. One of the most difficult parts about getting into therapy for me was finding a therapist that I actually connected with. And the price of finding a therapist can be expensive and overwhelming, which is why BetterHelp offers a more affordable alternative to in-person therapy where you can start communicating with your therapist in less than 48 hours. And those are just some of the reasons I'd like to thank BetterHelp who are giving I spent a day with viewers and listeners 10% off their first month at betterhelp.com slash That's betterhelp.com. Slash and I'd also like to thank Honey for sponsoring this episode. Honey, of course, is the easy way to save when you're shopping on your iPhone or your computer. It's a free browser extension that scours the internet for promo codes and applies the best one that it finds to your cart so you no longer have to stare at that empty discount code box because if Honey finds a working coupon, a little Honey button drops down and all you have to do is click apply coupon. And Honey supports over 30,000 stores online, ranging from tech to popular fashion brands and even food delivery, so no matter what, you're set. I've personally been getting more into reading lately, and Honey has saved me 
a lot of money when I'm online looking for those books. And Honey doesn't just work on desktops, it also works on your iPhone. You just activate it on Safari on your phone and you can save on the go. It's free and it installs in just a few seconds, so if you want to do yourself a solid and also support this series, get PayPal Honey for free at joinhoney.com slash Padilla. That's joinhoney.com slash Padilla. Now back to the world of Mary Knight. Many people would say, if that ever happened to me, there's no way I would talk publicly about it. That's horrifying. And that's, in many ways, people would say that's shameful mm -hmm. to have experienced those things, mm -hmm. to have taken part in those things, mm -hmm. especially because you were forced to do things, <laughs> literally, with a gun to your mm -hmm. head, mm -hmm. but you still participated in those things. Mm -hmm. Why is it that you talk about it publicly? To help other people, to help fellow survivors. I mean, that that is, that's my life's work. I don't judge other survivors who don't talk about it publicly. And I've actually known people who talk about some of it, like the incest, but they don't talk about others. And they'll, uh, they'll maybe not talk about the child sex trafficking. I actually had someone who said, I just recently went public about the sex trafficking, uh, child sex trafficking, but she said, I won't tell anyone about the ritualistic abuse. The satanic ritual abuse is the last thing people will talk about. And I so appreciate being able to talk about it here because they just say we're crazy. They yeah. just say we as survivors are crazy. Is that the number one thing you're told you're crazy about? Yes, yes, yeah. That That's, that's the thing I'm most criticized about. I mean, I've had friends who say, don't put that in your films. Don't go public about that. You'll you'll be too criticized. Mm -hmm. um, you'll they won't believe any of it when you say that. I mean, you wrote a book and you included it in the book. I think one of the most interesting parts about this is how happy you look. I mean, it's called My Life Now because you you know one of the reasons that you're talking about this is that you want to show that you can experience these very horrible things in your life, but you can grow beyond it. You can yes. literally have yourself smiling on a yes. book talking about the most horrific things that anyone could possibly imagine. Yes. They have three essays in it that tell in detail the bizarre abuse. Mm -hmm. And they are, well, like one of my friends said, it's the most brutal thing I've ever read. But some people do want the details. So they're in there, but you can read about the good parts of my life psychological benefits of delayed recall. Mm. I My life is better because I didn't always remember the abuse. Right. Have you received any backlash or hateful comments from, you know, online telling your story? Very little. My film has been viewed about a million times. I've gotten a few negative comments. Mm -hmm. And uh, mostly I get survivors uh, telling, maybe telling their story, but I get a lot of Thank yous, mm -hmm. and um, so I'm. I I, I want to say that because I was afraid horrible things would happen to me if I told. I mean, my parents said horrible things would happen to me if I told, and my life has been good. It seems so difficult. The idea of finding closure after experiencing that, or forgiving the people that did these horrific things to you. But in your documentary, you show you at the gravesite of of your parents and I broke down into tears a bit watching the way that you talked to your parents there. You you had a, a photo of your father when he was a child, when he was just five years old and you were looking at him and talking to him as if he were still that age. Yeah, but then the next thing I did, I brought that home with me, I put it up in my house and then I'm like, there's no place for this. There was no place for him in my life. And I went back to the grave again and I left the photo, I, I left the frame photograph there and I just said, you have never been a father to me. God is the only father I've ever had because fathers are protective. Some people say forgiveness is necessary and I don't believe that. I think that survivors need to find their own way to find closure. I'm not angry and I'm not sad thinking about my parents. So to me that's acceptance. Mm -hmm. Whether it's forgiveness or not, someone can tell. Mm. You know, I used to I used to talk about forgiveness as the F word. Mm. <laughs> yeah, because I I've seen people being like pushing themselves too hard to forgive. Mm -hmm. And it ends up with them um hurting themselves. I think nurturing yourself, I think being gentle with yourself, I think 
giving yourself time, those are things that are healing. But if you push someone to forgive, sometimes who they don't forgive is themselves. Mm. And forgiving yourself is, uh, I do believe that's essential. The other thing I want to talk about that I re- that really helped me when I was a child mm-hmm. is people being kind. People being mm-hmm. kind to children. I had teachers who were so kind to me. I had a science teacher in high school who uh, I was, I had changed schools and the school I came from was way behind. He said, well, I can work with you after school. Mm-hmm. And so he did. And uh, I'd read the chapters, I'd ask him questions. And after just about three or four times, he said, well, you're caught up now and you don't need to come in anymore. And he laughed. And at that moment, I didn't remember my abuse, but I'm like, there's something unusual about this transaction. And it was like, he could have said or done something to me that was wrong, and he didn't. When you're abused, like I was abused, having a good person in your life means so much. It means so much more than than anyone would think. Um, And yeah, I think that's a way to save children like me because there weren't any signs of me being abused. There really weren't. What I believe is you can save a child's life even if you can't rescue that child. Mm -hmm. People want to rescue children. I get it. And I, I do too. But there's some children you may not be able to rescue, but you can still save their life just by being good. You might not even know that they need rescuing. No, none so. of my teachers knew it. None of my teachers knew I needed rescuing. So be good to children. That's be right. Be kind to children. Be kind to children. Any chance you get, be mm-hmm. kind to children. Mm-hmm. And that could be the thing that makes them feel like life is worth living. Yes, it did for me. It absolutely did for me. If there is anyone watching who has gone through something similar, whether it be the trafficking or the satanic rituals, and maybe they're even having trouble recalling some of these memories or they've had some of these memories and they've had people from all different directions just like you tell them that they're just making up these memories. Is there anything that you'd want to say to them? Yeah, I, I really, this is when I would say that psychotherapy is is usually needed in that situation. Um, and I, I did, I've gotten an email from someone saying I don't trust psychotherapists and, and I offer to talk to her on phone because, you know, maybe hearing my voice would make a difference, but you you just, you really are probably going to need psychotherapy as a part of your healing journey. Um, If if you're just really not comfortable doing that, or like the young woman who contacted me from Pakistan, it's just not available, then um, journaling could be helpful. Um, There is private Facebook groups. Contact me and I'll help you get in contact with those private Facebook groups. You really need some support. You cannot do this on your own. What I really say to someone who's a survivor is I hope you find a really good psychotherapist because that can make a difference. I did get ready to remember before I remembered. Um. I I did. I, I remember thinking, all my clothes are drab, you know? Mm-hmm. And, purposely thinking, I'm going to shop for things that show my figure. I bought a dress, and and I'm like, I look just like a bimbo. I'm buying this, you know, and the lady. <laughs> the bimbo the, I've always dreamed of being. Yes, the, yeah, the lady <laughs> at the dress shop was like, I've heard other people say that, but they never bought it. So anyway, so yeah, 